This video is brought to you by NVIDIA GeForce Now powered by Pentanet, which has finally landed on Australian shores. I've been using it during its beta phase and have been very happy with the results. Australians, stick around to the end of the video to learn more. <clears throat> Okay, I'm really sorry about that. I'll never do that again, I promise. But I couldn't help myself because we finally, finally got to see some actual Halo Infinite campaign gameplay. So it just felt right. I'm, I'm sorry for the permanent damage I've no doubt done to your ears. Hopefully your health insurance covers it. Ladies and gentlemen, what a week it has been. GTA Trilogy Remaster, Halo gameplay, Starfield news, God of War on PC, and a Splinter Cell game. Can this week just chill the fuck out already? Do you know how hard it is to fit this episode into 20-ish minutes? I can hear the disappointment in Austin's voice when I hand him a 5,000 word script and he's like, Oh man, this is gonna be a long one, isn't it? Yes it is, Austin. Yes it is. With that said, let's not waste any more time. Let's get straight into the news. Biggest story of the week, maybe, probably. I don't know, there are a lot of big stories this week. One of the biggest stories of the week was the reveal of the Grand Theft Auto Trilogy Remaster, subtitled The Definitive Edition. Rockstar dropped a brief but informative trailer showcasing the huge graphical overhaul that each title was getting. And I gotta say, I think this looks really damn impressive. Kotaku had earlier reported that all three games were being rebuilt in Unreal Engine, which seemed very unlikely. And while Rockstar haven't formally announced that, a data mine leak earlier this month all but confirmed it. Now having seen the game in action, Kotaku's reporting makes a lot of sense because this is no minor touch-up. The amount of detail that has been added to the world is crazy, but Rockstar has still managed to capture the essence of GTA's blocky visuals. Fans are a lot more divided on the approach to character models, particularly those of the protagonist, and yeah, gotta agree there, they do look a little weird. Seeing that much detail in faces that were historically devoid of that detail is a little jarring. We all had our own imagining of how these characters looked, and whatever that was, this certainly was not it. Still, it feels like a minor quibble given how impressive everything else is. This is hitting PlayStation, Xbox, Switch, and the Rockstar PC launcher on November 11th, and it's retailing for for 60 US dollars, but good news, the entire remastered trilogy will be available on PS Now commencing December 7th, and the remastered San Andreas is arriving on Game Pass on day one. I really hope that Rockstar snuck in a remastered hot coffee mod since that shit got San Andreas banned in Australia, and I want to see what all the fuss was about. Let's stick with the big stuff. We finally, finally got a look at some Halo Infinite campaign gameplay. Let's take a quick look. Halo Infinite allows us all to become Master Chief, doing what Spartans do best, defying the odds to take down the banished. Did you see that? Chief did a rendezvous. Hope he doesn't get sued by EA for that one. This was a make or break moment for 343. Since the last time we saw campaign gameplay, Craig was born. What a dish, look at him. That hairline, that chiseled brow, those deep, beady puppy dog eyes. Craig was a sensation, unlike the rest of Halo Infinite, which met a fan backlash so universal that Microsoft delayed the game for an entire year, abandoning the dream of having Halo Infinite as a launch title for Microsoft's shiny new fridge, I mean, console. So the stakes were pretty high when 343 clicked play on their showcase this week, and look, I don't know to be honest. The response to it has been overwhelmingly positive, with social media awash with hype and the YouTube video buried under an avalanche of likes. And I'm really happy that other people are happy, but I'm not on the same page, to be honest, at least not yet. I'm not quite sold on the idea that Halo needs to be open world, clearing outposts and collecting resources to upgrade stuff. I just don't know about that. Halo Sandbox was always so impressive, but that sandbox existed within very scripted missions with tentpole set piece moments. I didn't see any set piece moments here. They were all player created. Maybe the game has them, but they didn't want to show them to protect spoilers or whatever. Or maybe it doesn't, and 343 are betting it all on the power of their sandbox. I don't know. I still remain very excited for Infinite, and I'm definitely rooting for 343 to succeed, but I've got a few question marks bouncing around my head right now that stop me from getting on board the full steam ahead hype train. Bottom line, I am looking forward to playing Halo Infinite in December. Speaking of Halo, Bungie, remember those guys? This week Destiny was at the top of the game subreddit and it was trending all over Twitter, and that can mean only one thing. Bungie did another monetization oopsie. This week, Bungie provided further details on how it was going to charge for endgame content in their Witch Queen expansion, clarifying that dungeons, which are kind of like mini raids, would for the first time not be included in the expansion price, 
or even in the season pass prices. They are instead only accessible if you purchase the digital deluxe edition upgrade of the game or purchase them a la carte through an option that Bungie will be providing later. This is a complex topic, so I'm going to give you my brief take on it. No one actually thinks that these dungeons aren't worth the $10 or whatever that Bungie is asking for. Dollar for dollar, these experiences will certainly provide more hours of entertainment than any movie you'd pay to see. Hell, they're roughly the same price as those stupidly oversized American coffees. How do you guys put that amount of coffee into your body at one time? I don't understand. The issue is how chopped up and monetized and spivvy Destiny feels when it does stuff like this. It's got an expansion, it's got season passes, a deluxe upgrade that gates endgame content, a cash shop chocked full of stuff, seasonal events that are essentially just a chance to pump the cash shop, and still, objectively, the worst, most stingy transmog system across all of video games. Absolute embarrassment. Destiny is a top shelf, genre-defining premium game of the highest quality, and yet its confusing piecemeal monetization makes Destiny feel like a scrappy free-to-play game just trying to eke out an existence. When Bungie does this, they don't take anything away from me because I already bought the Deluxe Edition. Instead, they take away the ability for me to recruit my friends to the game. Because whenever I say, hey, you should try Destiny, they're going to be too overwhelmed and confused to know what to buy, or they're just going to be like, no thanks, I hear that game's a scam. It's not a scam, it's amazing. But when Bungie pulls shit like this, I can absolutely understand why people would think that, and it's a shame. Anyway, comment section, we may now commence the weekly ritual of you roasting me for still being a Destiny fan. I, I, I deserve it. All right, let's change speed now. Let's do some good news. Here it comes, get ready. God of War, PC. Yes, that is the appropriate response to the announcement this week that 2018's God of War is making its way to PC, with modders salivating at the thought of finally being able to remove Kratos' loincloth and then apply a slider to what lies beneath. The news came direct from Sony, who uploaded a trailer showcasing the features PC players can expect, stuff like native 4K support, unlocked frame rates, Nvidia DLSS, and ultra-wide support for when you want to set that slider all the way to the right. The announcement isn't as surprising as you might think, in large part because Sony has been making a very concerted push into the PC space of late, releasing both Horizon Zero Dawn and Days Gone on PC, while also purchasing a studio that specializes in porting console games to PC. Sony have made no secret of the the fact that PC is going to become a bigger part of their strategy, but unlike Microsoft, they've been pretty clear that PlayStation exclusives will only make their way to PC after a lengthy period of time on their consoles first, which makes sense given the fact that their business model is still very much based on console sales. Xbox are, of course, trying to become increasingly less reliant on consoles, and Game Pass is a central pillar in that strategy. So it was a sad day for Uncle Phil this week when Microsoft announced that Game Pass had missed some of its key growth targets. Game Pass's subscriber base grew 37% when Microsoft had set a target for 48%. Still, growing nearly 40% in a year isn't bad, and there's only good times ahead for Xbox as more of its studio investments begin to pay dividends. Microsoft are promising at least one big AAA flagship release every quarter, culminating in the release of Starfield in November 2022. When that happens, I don't think Game Pass is going to be struggling for subscribers. Sticking with Microsoft, Phil Spencer again reiterated this week that Xbox had no plans to enter the VR market, saying that while he applauds what Sony, Valve and Oculus are doing, he just doesn't feel like it's the right time for Xbox to direct its resources into that space. It's the classic, it's not you, it's me. Phil would go on to explain that software will remain the focus for Xbox. Quote, I think that the hardware innovation that's happening is great and it's an important enabler, but right now I'm deciding to stay more in the software side of that enablement. I believe it will scale better in the long run." End quote. That certainly makes sense, but VR is growing quickly, with Oculus Quest 2 continuing to smash sales records and more core gaming offerings being released each week, like the recent Resident Evil 4 VR port. Sony have provided many updates on their upcoming PSVR 2 headset, which industry analysts expect will be released in holiday 2022. So Xbox are a little brave to be out there on their own for this one. Let's hope they're not left standing at the dock if the VR ship ever sets sail for the mainstream. Well, I promised you some Starfield news, so here it is. This week, we've got our first update on the game in a long ass time. Design director Emil Pagliarulo hosted a brief showcase of some concept art underpinning Starfield's world, giving us a brief glimpse of potential locations and character designs. There's an interesting mix of high 
sci-fi settings, stuff like Mass Effect Citadel, to crowded Blade Runner inspired slums to alien wastelands. You can never draw too many conclusions from concept art, but it all looked nice, and the character designs in particular looked great. With Starfield releasing next year, I expect we'll get a few more minor drops like this early next year, culminating in a gameplay reveal at E3 2022. I'll be there in the crowd, probably, so long as Todd isn't, you know, guarding the entrances, in which case I think I'd need a disguise or something, I don't know. Maybe a cardboard box. That could work. Man, there is no end to the big news this week. Here comes the next one. Cyberpunk 2077 and The Witcher 3 next-gen versions both got a release window this week. Cyberpunk is hitting quarter one 2022, while The Witcher 3 will hit in quarter two. The next-gen updates are very, very behind schedule, owing to the fact that CD Projekt Red had to redirect vast amounts of resources to get Cyberpunk patched and finished in general, let alone playable on last-gen consoles. Let's not forget that it was only a few months ago that Sony returned Cyberpunk to the PSN for sale after yanking it off there when it became clear that the PS4 version was laughably unfinished. And CD Projekt Red unilaterally announced a refund program without first consulting Sony on the mechanics of that. It'll be really interesting to see how this next-gen version is received. If it works well, a lot of people will, for the first time, experience Cyberpunk as it was intended on next-gen hardware and without the plethora of bugs that crippled it. It is a deeply deeply unpopular opinion that I am regularly ridiculed for, but I still maintain that Cyberpunk is an extremely worthwhile game despite its weak RPG and its missing features. And I'll be interested to see what conclusions people reach when they revisit the game on their PS5s and Xbox Series consoles. Returning to that unfortunate Activision Blizzard mess, you know the one where decades of sexism and abusive management were revealed after a California government agency sued them? Yeah, that one. Well, this week, Blizzard provided an update on one of the promised in-game changes, renaming their cowboy, McCree. McCree was named after Blizzard developer Jesse McCree, who was removed from the company in connection with the allegations made in the lawsuit. As such, Blizzard announced some weeks back that they would change the name of their cowboy fighter, and furthermore would update their policy to prohibit the naming of any in-game character after a real-life person. The new name was revealed in a snazzy JPEG, Cole Cassidy. And yeah, that sounds cowboy enough for me. More than a few people are roasting Blizzard for making this change, calling it unnecessary and performative nonsense. I don't agree. Changing the in-game fart emotes is nonsense. Wanting to separate your in-game character names from a person who allegedly contributed to a toxic or dangerous work environment, that makes a lot of sense. And I think it's totally the right call for Blizzard to make. By the way, did you know there's an amateur wrestler who goes by the name of Cole Cassidy? He's got a cowboy hat and everything. Let's hope Blizzard don't have another lawsuit on their hands. That's the last thing they need. Here's some news that made me super happy. The lead writer for the upcoming Wolverine game from Insomniac is the same person who wrote Spec Ops The Line. If you've never played Spec Ops The Line, it's one of the best examples of maybe gameplay isn't all that important, since it's a fairly stock standard, often clunky military shooter, but the storyline that unfolds in it is one of the best and most memorable across all of video games, especially in a genre that really produces anything remotely surprising or interesting. Insomniac had earlier mentioned that Wolverine would be mature in tone, and yeah, you've certainly hired the right lead writer for the job, since Spec Ops The Line went into some pretty dark places. This is a great hire, and I'm super keen to see what Insomniac are going to do with one of the most beloved characters across all of pop culture. And finally, I saved the best news for last. It looks like we are getting a new Splinter Cell game. Please don't be Battle Royale. Please don't be Battle Royale. Please don't be Battle Royale. It's probably going to be a Battle Royale. Yes, this week, Video Games Chronicle reported that they had confirmed from multiple sources that a new Splinter Cell game had been greenlit by Ubisoft and that it comes as an effort to, quote, win back fans frustrated by recent efforts to revive the franchise in the mobile and VR spaces, end quote. Yeah, no shit. See, I'm immediately suspicious of this news because it implies that Ubisoft cares what we think. And I just don't buy that. The report would go on to say that the studio behind it isn't confirmed, but it may be handled outside of the Montreal studio which has traditionally handled Splinter Cell games. The title is apparently in early production, but it might be revealed next year if only to get us off Ubisoft's case since I'm sure they're very tired of us asking for it. As excited as I am about this news, I'm reminded of the recent Ghost Recon Frontline reveal, or the announcement of Assassin's Creed Infinity, a live service Assassin's Creed that literally never ends. Ubisoft rarely greenlights big projects that aren't live service platforms, and I really hope that Splinter Cell doesn't suffer the same fate, but yeah man, 
Uh, it's, uh, I don't know. So what got announced or delayed this week? Well, Oddworld Soulstorm Enhanced Edition was announced, arriving on all platforms but the Switch in late November. It's going to be a free update to existing owners of the game and it promises gameplay enhancements without really saying what they are. This is kind of weird to be honest. It feels like a soft relaunching of this product since I don't imagine it sold particularly well during its initial launch window. Uh, this is a bit odd. King Arthur's Knight's Tale is an Arthurian tactics game that's been in early access for a while now. That's been getting some positive buzz. It just announced it'll be leaving early access on February 15th next year. Probably not the best month for an indie title to be launching, but good luck to them. Microsoft announced that Flight Simulator would be getting a Game of the Year edition releasing on November 18th. The new edition has a bunch of new aircrafts and new airports and new missions and new tutorials and just more new stuff. And since it's a first party Microsoft title, all of it will of course be available on Game Pass on day one. Speaking of Game Pass, Among Us is finally making its way to Xbox on December 14th and it too will be available on Game Pass day one. So if you're like the last human on the planet that hasn't yet played Among Us, then now you can. A while back, id Software confirmed that the promised invasion mode from Doom Eternal was getting scrapped in favor of a more traditional horde mode which was a bit of a bummer but id know what they're doing so if they say that invasion mode wasn't working then that's good enough for me the new horde mode releases today it's a free update to anyone that owns doom eternal or anyone who chooses to play it through game pass so check that out if you can the most wholesome announcement of the week must surely go to stardew valley creator concerned ape who this week revealed the existence of his next project haunted chocolatier if you're not familiar with how Stardew Valley was made, this guy basically locked himself in a room for four years and made it all on his own. And then he worked a bunch more years after that, adding huge amounts of new features to the game. It's perhaps the greatest indie success story in all of video games since the game has gone on to sell millions of copies, and Concerned Ape got to keep all that paper for himself because he self-published the game. Good on him. Haunted Chocolatier certainly looks familiar with its art style and some of its mechanics, but the new premise of being a chocolate maker inside a haunted mansion is just too tempting to not be interested in. I don't know how he came up with that concept, but the man certainly knows what he's doing. There's no release date for this one yet, because in typical Concerned Ape fashion, it'll be done when it's ready. And finally, one piece of delay news this week. The upcoming Advance Wars 1 and 2 remaster has been delayed, pushed from its planned release date on December 3rd into Northern Spring 2022, which is actually a pretty chunky delay. They said they needed more time for fine tuning, which is fine. Take all the time you need. Insert Miyamoto quote here. Let's go on to the next section. So what came out last week? Well, for a while now, I've had my eye on a game called Sands of Aura, a stunningly beautiful isometric open world action game. They've been in development for some time now and made a surprise release into early access last week with very little fanfare, to be honest. A shame because I think a game that looks this good could have made a bit more of a splash had they put some marketing dollars behind it prior to the announcement. The reviews so far are 81% positive, so that's an encouraging sign for a game that still has a long development road ahead. I wish the developers all the best. Inscription arrived on PC and whoa, Nelly has this landed well. This game has been out for less than a week and already has like 8,000 reviews, 95% of which are positive. That is gigantic. That is huge. That is mind blowing. Congratulations to the developer Daniel Mullins and congrats to Devolver Digital for once again picking a winner. These guys are the best odds makers in the business and you'd be a damn fool to bet against them. Into the Pit arrived on Xbox and PC as a day one Game Pass release. It's that retro inspired shooter where you run around with jazz hands. Reviews on this one are sitting at 78% mostly positive on Steam, with critic scores landing a little lower at around 70 on Metacritic at the moment. The Dark Pictures Anthology House of Ashes arrived on all platforms but the Switch, and it's done pretty well for itself, certainly less divisive than the previous games in the series. Metacritic has it between 70 and 75 depending on platform. PC Gamer scored it an 80 saying, quote, Great monsters, stunning locations, and a quality mystery makes this one of Supermassive's best, end quote. Finally, Resident Evil 4 VR hit the Oculus Quest 2, and everyone loves it. It hasn't got a Metacritic page, but it's sitting at 85 on OpenCritic. Fantastic result. GameSpot gave it a rare 9 out of 10, saying, quote, Capcom Survival Horror Classic shines on Oculus Quest 2, making it a must-play version for fans that can, end quote. If you can brave the terror of your auntie linking you cat memes and 
vaccine disinformation, it might just be worth creating a Facebook account to experience this one. So what's coming out this week? Well, pretty huge week actually. Kicking things off is Marvel's Guardians of the Galaxy from Eidos Montreal and Square Enix, which released yesterday on all platforms. Everyone had the lowest expectations and the highest skepticism for this one, owing to the disastrous Avengers release, a game that I personally appreciated greatly, since it's been the gift that keeps on giving here on this channel. Well, sad times, ladies and gentlemen, we won't be able to add Guardians of the Galaxy to our regular dunk on this repertoire because it is actually very, very good. I reviewed it this week and gave it a strong recommend. Link to that review in the description below. I wasn't the only one who loved it. Most of the reviews are very positive, sitting at around 80 on Metacritic, depending on platform. 90% very positive on Steam. Huge success here for Eidos Montreal, so congratulations on nailing this one. Releasing today into early access, exclusive to PC, is Forgive Me Father. It describes itself as a dark retro horror FPS, and I've had my eye on this one for a while since the visuals are just really, really nice. Kind of like a creepy Borderlands. Not much buzz around this one yet, but hopefully the early access period helps put it on people's radars. Releasing tomorrow, exclusive to PC and on Xbox Game Pass as a day one release, Age of Empires 4. I feel like no one's really talking about this one, like, at all. This is a big deal, right? Like, it's a new Age of Empires game, it's here. But did you know that there's a new Age of Empires game releasing tomorrow? Well, you guys probably did, because you're all huge nerds. But I suspect the average Joe wouldn't. Still, the title has reviewed very well, 83 on Metacritic. Game Informer scored it an 83, saying, quote, While Age of Empires 4 lacks any ambition to even gently jostle the standard set by Age of Empires two decades earlier, it's a good way to play a classic-feeling RTS today with some slick polish and panache, end quote. I hope this does well. The RTS genre is so niche these days, so it's nice to know it's still getting some big releases from time to time. Fatal Frame, Maiden of Blackwater, releases on all platforms on the 28th. This is a remaster of the 2014 release, which back then was exclusive to the Nintendo Wii, and now everyone can experience it. Another on the 28th, Ubisoft Riders Republic arriving on all platforms but the Switch, which is a shame because I think this would have worked really well on the Switch actually. It's Ubi's latest swing at trying to make extreme sports a thing where their previous efforts haven't hit pay dirt. I played this during a preview and also during the trial week that just wrapped up. I enjoy this. I'm going to review it on Saturday most likely. But unless anything terrible pops up before then, I'm probably just gonna say good things about it. It's a good time if you're looking for some chilled out fun either alone or with your friends, so yeah, check it out. Yoko Taro's Voice of Cards releases on the 28th. Reviews aren't out for this one at the time of writing, which is a shame because I really want to see what the deal with this one is. I guess I'll report back next week. And finally, Mario Party Superstars releases on the 29th, exclusive to the Switch. The game is a kind of celebration of the best mini games from the Mario Party series, with a big focus on the Nintendo 64 era, but a total of 100 mini-games pulled from previous entries in the series. There's 12 Mario Party games, by the way, so that's a pretty deep well to draw from. Put this on your radar. We are the new searchers. We may not always seek the same things, or even be on the same journey. Bound by shared moments of wonder. This is Book of Travels, and it released into early access a few weeks back. It's a really interesting deconstruction of the MMORPG genre, to the point where it actually bills itself as a TMORPG, or a tiny multiplayer online role-playing game. You create a character that's more about their personality and approach than their RPG stat sheet numbers, and then you're free to roam about the world as you see fit. There isn't a beginning or an end to this world, it simply exists as a space for you to find small adventures or quiet moments, or perhaps even bump into other players as the game has a dynamic matchmaking system working in the background that will drop players in and out of your world, similar to something like Journey, which is actually a pretty pertinent parallel given that you also communicate non-verbally to everyone through the use of symbols. Book of Travels might be the connected, immersive, role-playing based experience you're looking for if the grind of traditional MMOs just isn't doing it for you anymore. It's had a successful launch into early access and it has a long roadmap ahead of it. If you're interested in getting in on the ground floor, I'll leave a link to its Steam page below. Sort of free stuff time and we have a pretty solid week here propped up by a strong Game Pass showing. Let's do Epic first though. Right now you can still grab a among the Sleep, but on the 29th, that'll tick over to Dark Complete Edition. That game was made low-key famous back in 2019 when the developer turned down the offer of having the game released exclusively on the Epic Games Store, only for Epic to then turn around and refuse to sell the game at all. The developer stuck to his guns and released the game on Steam, and years later, the game is now being given away for free on the Epic Store. That's quite a turnaround for old Tim Sweeney there, but 
It wouldn't be the first time. Game Pass. This is the good stuff right here. Xbox provided an update on the upcoming monthly refresh, and it's looking very solid indeed. Dragon Ball Z Fighter arrives for both cloud and console, while that newly released indie title Into the Pit arrives for cloud, console, and PC. The Forgotten City is in there, and that is great news. Now, I didn't love that one as much as many other people did, but it really is worth checking out if you're into narrative-driven games, time loop games, detective games. This is one of the highest rated releases of the year, actually, so don't let my tepid review dissuade you. Check it out for yourself. Everspace 2 arrives as an early access title on Game Pass. I really hope you guys check this one out because it's getting so much love from anyone who plays it. It's an exploration-based shooter, but it's also a looter. You roam around the galaxy exploring amazing looking locations, blowing shit up, and then using the wreckage to upgrade your ship with crazy randomized components. What is not to love about that formula? We've already mentioned that Age of Empires is hitting PC Game Pass this month, but the other PC offering is Outriders, which was earlier available for Xbox console Game Pass only. To be honest, I haven't returned to this game since its very buggy launch, so I can't tell you if it's fixed. I can tell you that even despite its bugs, I enjoyed it. So if it's in good shape now, I think you're in for a good time, and I certainly recommend checking it out. Quick shout out to the Humble Bundle this week. There's a fighting game bundle up there that is exceptionally good value. For around 13 US dollars, you can get nine games, including Soul Calibur 4, Injustice 2, Power Rangers, Battle for the Grid, Killer Instinct, Mortal Kombat 10, and a bunch more stuff. That's a good price tag, especially given the fact that a good chunk of that change will go to charity. Finally, quick reminder that this is the last week of the month, so don't forget to grab your monthly PS Plus games, your games with gold, and those fantastic Twitch Prime games. All of those will be disappearing in the next few days, so get them before they're gone. Guys, we are way over time today. I can see the vein in Austin's forehead growing larger with every word I type. So let's make this feel-good story of the week a quick one. You ready? Anyone who has studied the deep lore of Mario knows that his first name is Mario, and his surname is Mario. That was established as canon in the seminal 1993 cinematic masterpiece, Super Mario Brothers. Well, this week, a fan by the name of Joseph Fruhold advanced a different and I think more compelling theory of Mario's true name. He reminded us that Mario is Japanese, and if you've been listening to anything that Mario has said over the last few years, it's obvious that his family name is Itsumi. And since the Japanese say their family names first, Mario would introduce himself as... Itsumi Mario. <laughs> Get it? Itsumi Mario? Okay, guys, I think this episode has ended as badly as it began, but you still made it to the end, so you really deserve a pat on the back for that one. Thank you, as always, for stopping by and spending some of your week here with... <laughs> it's, it's funny, man. It's funny. Thank you, as always, for stopping by and spending some of your week here with me. I always appreciate it. If you found any of this remotely enjoyable, unlikely, or remotely useful, there's a chance, or remotely funny, impossible, and could I ask you to please drop a coin to your Witcher by hitting the like button on the video and clicking the subscribe button so we can do all this again next week. You might even want to ding that notification bell so you can race to type first into the comment section because that is something that human beings choose to do for some reason so you can choose to do it as well if you like. All right, so that's the end of the video and if you are not Australian, you may go. But Australians, let us all rejoice for we have cloud gaming. Am I allowed to do that to the anthem? I'm just gonna- I'm gonna do it. Yes! The nation most famous for its tin cans connected by strings internet is finally, FINALLY kangaroo hopping into the 21st century 21 years late. Powered by local ISP Pentanet, NVIDIA's GeForce now has this week graced our girded by sea shores, meaning you can start playing max settings, ray trace enabled games without having to spend thousands of dollars on a high-end rig, and you can even play those games on your phone or tablet if you want to. Alright, so let me break it down because there's a lot of good stuff here and I don't want you to miss any of it. GeForce Now powered by Pentanet is a cloud gaming platform that allows you to play your games on almost any device. Your iPhone, your Android tablet, your crappy old computer that can barely run Minesweeper, whatever. This is possible because GeForce Now does all the graphical processing in the cloud and it just beams you an image similar to something like Netflix. So if you have an internet connection at 15 megabytes per second or higher, you can start playing games through the cloud on almost any device. So for example, this is me playing Watch Dogs Legion, 1080p, 60fps with ray tracing enabled on my phone. 
pretty wild, huh? But what if you don't want to use your phone? That's fine. This is footage of me playing Control on my PC through the handy GeForce Now PC client. I just browse through the list of games that I own, I boot it up, and within seconds, I'm playing Control with ray tracing enabled. This is awesome because it means that you don't have to spend thousands of dollars for a next-gen GPU to enjoy games like this at max settings with ray tracing. You can just play it through GeForce Now and save yourself the cash. You're gonna be wondering about latency, and yeah, there's a little bit. I wouldn't be playing a Twitch shooter like CSGO on this, but for 95% of the games that I play and that many of us play, this works just fine. And during the beta, I was really impressed by how smoothly everything was running for me. The thing I love most about this service, and the reason I'm recommending it to you, is that GeForce Now, powered by Pentanet, respects your existing game libraries. You don't have to buy your games twice with GeForce Now. There's over 1,000 compatible games and more are being added every week. And if you own those games already on Steam or Epic or Ubisoft Connect, then you can play them on either your local hardware or through GeForce Now. That choice is entirely yours, it's up to you. GeForce Now, powered by Pentanet, launched last week in Australia after a very successful beta, and guess what? You can try it for free. There is a free tier, so you don't have to take my word for any of this. I would love it if you guys did me a solid and clicked the link, signed up, checked it out for yourself. Not only because Nvidia would be like, good job, shill up, but also because I really think that there's value in this for you if you want to play games on the go, if you want to be able to keep playing in another room when your wife kicks you off the PC, if you want to play PC exclusive games, but don't want to have to shell out the dosh for a PC, or if you just are interested in seeing this whole cloud streaming thing that we've heard all these other countries talk about for so long and you just want to see how it runs here in Australia, this is our time. You can try it for free or you can sign up for a priority subscription to secure your founder's price and your founder's price will actually be locked in for the full lifetime of your subscription so it's a great time to sign up. Thanks GeForce Now powered by Pentanet for sponsoring the video and thank you for watching it. Thanks for watching my video. If you liked it, give it a thumbs up. If you didn't, give it a thumbs down so I know to do better for next time. If you enjoyed yourself, consider subscribing. And if you really enjoyed yourself, maybe consider hitting that notification bell so you never miss a video. You can see my patrons here on the left. They're awesome. They're amazing. If you want to join them, check out my Patreon page. Thank you again. I'll see you next time. Bye-bye.